Well, hello again, everybody. This is John Norris at Trading Perspectives. As always, we have our very good friend, Sam Clement. Sam, say hello. Hey, John. You doing okay today, my friend? doing awesome. How are you doing? I'm doing okay today. I really can't complain. And how in the world can you really complain, Sam, when you think about all this debt that we have out there just absolutely sloshing around, governments creating money out of thin air, central banks backstopping this and that. Every time there's a problem in the world, someone with some kind of power decides to throw either dollars or yen or euro or pounds or yeah. I mean it's almost like what do we have to worry about? Yeah. What do we have to worry about? Nothing. Because interest rates are low, the price of money is super cheap. We have all this debt. And we can Who can be broke? It's kind of like the old joke, you know, how can I be out of money when I've got all these checks? Yeah. How can we be out of money as a society or we as can't. a global economy when we've got all these bonds we can't. Sam, what say you? We can't we can't be out of money. <laughs> As long as we keep kicking it and kicking it down the road, it's like, you know, the the representative from Kentucky put an act forward called the act to kick the can down the road. And that's kind of what we are kind of doing right now. I mean, as long as money's cheap, why not kick it down the road? Well, the thing is, you're absolutely right. Money is cheap. And the price of money is really just reflected in interest rates. I mean, that's it. That's how much a borrower has to pay yeah. in order to give you uh, in order for you the investor or the lender uh-huh. to, to lend the money. It's, so, it's, a, it's a measurement of risk in a sense. Yeah, that's, a, bit, know, how that's much, a better way of putting it. I was stumbling over my words. What, what am I, like, how much risk am I taking? You know, if you're a risky, ri- risky, <laughs> the thiefy, the thiefy for you to <laughs> say. If you're a risky lender, <laughs> I'm going to require a better return to possibly risk yeah. losing my money to you and, and so forth. And right now, no one really views the U.S. as a, as a risky lender. I mean, well, at one point two percent for thirty years. I mean, Sam. I mean, let's let's face facts here. How many trillions does the U.S. Treasury have in debt officially? <laughs> a lot. It's, there are more trillions. We are more trillions in hawk than you have ages. Yep. Or years, yep. or something along About, those lines. We're, we're over half a trillion a state right now. <laughs> That's not even including Puerto Rico. <laughs> how about that? And to show you how much the price of money is for the U.S. Treasury to borrow, I'm just going to rattle some things off. We've had the bond market sold off a little bit here um, today, but even so, Sam, the U.S. Treasury wants to borrow money for two years. It can do so at 0.15 percent. Yeah, that's per year. If they want to borrow, if it wants to borrow money for five years, it can do so at 0.28 percent. For ten years, Sam, ten years, a yeah. decade. Yeah. I think a decade ago, you were in junior high or middle school. Yeah, I was in uh, eighth grade. A decade ago, I was doing the exact same thing I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> a de- for, for 10 years, the U.S. Treasury can borrow money at 0.64%. How yeah. about that? Yeah. And, and then let's think about our friends over in the, the continent of Europe, the Europe. I mean, it's... Everyone knows that they have borrowed money with great aplomb over the years in uh-huh. order to uh, fund and finance their social safety nets and whatnot, yeah. but but our friends in our friends in France, if we want to call them friends, I mean, kind of fair weathered friends, yeah, I think. Yeah. And most of the skies must be blue out today. Uh, in France, they have negative interest rates in, in two years, meaning that you pay the the French equivalent of the treasury sixty seven basis points per year mm-hmm. to lend it money. Well, 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 let's take it back. To, to, oh, I've got more. Well, <laughs> let's look at the real rates, though, even. I mean, all these rates are cheap. Let's look at the real rates, yeah. the, the real return that, that you're getting. And, and it's what you're getting at and even in some absolute ones. But uh, even the U.S. real rates of return now on these fixed income is negative. <laughs> it's, it's, it's negative in France. I mean, I tell you, our, our, our friends, the French, again, fair weather friends. In Paris, Paris can borrow money for 10 years, Sam. For negative 21 basis points. Yeah. That means you, Sam, the lender, pay them 21 basis points per year mm-hmm. in order to get your money back. And assuming there is no inflation, that's a, you're down 2%. Yeah. If there is any inflation, well, that's going the other way. Yeah. And, and I've just, the hits keep on coming. The Greeks, our friends, the Greeks, who uh, had some problems all those years ago, they can borrow money for 10 years at 106. Yeah. And the Germans... Negative 48 basis points. I mean, the Japanese, two basis points out for 10 years. And the hits just keep on coming, Sam. We have washed the world in debt, and it doesn't cost a darn thing. So, so why wouldn't 
the Congress? Why wouldn't the Federal Reserve? Why wouldn't the British Exchequer? Why wouldn't the European Central Bank? Why wouldn't all these yeah. these uh-huh. these entities, these institutions, just say to hell with it? We're just going to print some more of that stuff. Yeah, well, the, you bring up a good point. Why not? And there, there's not a lot of reasons why you wouldn't want, basically, for all intents and purposes, with these negative real rates, you would not You would not turn down free money, right? I, I mean, how free? What do you mean by free? <laughs> free money. That's what the government's getting at these rates. And the real... The, Is it, what's the hook? I'm not, you're moving on. No I'm hook. still thinking about this everybody, free money stuff. Ev- everybody wants to throw free money at you, and that's what's happening with most of these wow. governments, and as long, they're, they're going to keep taking it. And, and you know, wow. looking at debt, it's not necessarily the the debt. You know, I, I guess it reaches a point where the debt itself becomes a problem, but a lot of it's what we're using this money for and what this debt is, is, is causing. And, you know, some debt is good. If, a, if someone takes out a loan to start a business and, and expands the economy, that, that's good debt. But a lot of what we're, we're churning out is not what I would consider good debt, but we continue to do it and at an increasing clip. Well, leading up to the financial crisis in 2008, you know, U.S. debt had grown at a rate much faster than GDP growth. Uh-huh. I mean, it wasn't even close. And so, and taking a look at it, we borrowed all this debt. Our GDP grew significantly less than, both on a real and nominal rate, by the way. Yeah. You know, we borrowed, we borrowed at, let's say, 10% and nominal GDP, not not adjusted for inflation, coming around 5 or 6%. Where'd the uh-huh. other 4% go, Sam? Yeah. And so, I, I sat there and I, I thought about it, and the only thing I could come... I, I, I could reason in my head is we ate the money. Mm-hmm. There, there's no, n- nothing else. We ate it. We burned it. We did something with it because it is the worst use of leverage of debt, whatever you want to call it, to borrow at a much higher rate and a much greater amount mm-hmm. than you're actually going to generate in overall economic activity. Yeah. yeah. That is when leverage gets to be a problem. But you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. What happens if we increase our borrowing by 3%, but we can turn that into 7% growth. Fantastic. Do that do all, that day, all long. day long. That's, I mean, that's what banks do. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I think that's why I helped start one. Yeah. <laughs> it's but, a great business yeah. model. <laughs> so you make that 4% spread yeah. on someone else's money. Yeah. You know? um, no, but, but, but what we've seen really over the last 20 years has been an explosion in public debt relative to GDP, uh-huh. meaning that we have we have been bad consumers, bad issuers, better yeah. of debt. We have we have borrowed unwisely because the money that we have borrowed has um, not that, increased the it, GDP. That has not increased the GDP by the same amount. As a result, we have eaten the money, and it seems as though we're eating the money right now with a $3 trillion CARES package, whatever is coming down the pike this next go around with the Federal Reserve doing quantitative easing yet again. And that's just the stuff that we know. Yeah, and you look at what the Fed's purchasing. They're purchasing some some fixed income issues from these really struggling companies, things like Apple and Microsoft and Berkshire Hathaway with impl- combined, you know, half a trillion dollars of cash sitting there, and then that's what they're using the cash for. So They're just <laughs> driving down the interest rates for people that have proved that they don't need to borrow yeah. money. So does that just crowd out? Does that, that crowd out private investment? And that's, a, that's the biggest concern. You know, back when I was in business school, you know, we were all very concerned about the debt. We were very concerned about the uh, monthly budget balance, mm-hmm. believe it or not. When I, this when was I, just a few years ago. What are you talking about? Just, <laughs> that's right, just a few years ago. Um, no, but back in, the, back in the early mid-'90s, I mean, we were very focused on the monthly budget statement. I mean, we were thinking. Our, we were thinking, and so the thought process goes: is the more debt that you borrow, the greater pressure it's going to put on the dollar, and therefore it's going to cause inflationary pressures. And it seems as though almost the exact opposite has mm-hmm. happened. We've borrowed all this money; the dollar is made relatively strong, and we haven't had what we would consider significant consumer price inflation yeah. in decades. And so. I mean, so I'm sitting here taking a look at everything. It's going, the price of money is cheaper than ever for mm-hmm. borrowers. We don't have at least structural inflation, although the producer price index was a little bit higher last month than anticipated. But so what in the hell was going on where money's cheap, inflation is not really, not really out there, Somehow it's just not intuitive, and that's what our clients are are, are, are worried. When when do we pay the piper yeah. on this? Because it's not a question of whether or not we will pay the piper. 
It's a question of when and what does that look like? Oh. I mean, does that look like we fall apart like Hungary did after World War II, or mm -hmm. we fall apart like Zimbabwe did back in the last decade. We fall apart like Argentina has over and over again. We yeah. fall apart yeah. like like the Germans did after World War One, or do we fall apart by having significantly lower rates of growth for an extended period yeah. of time? Yeah. You know, what do you think? is the more probable case scenario. Well, I think it's probably closer to the latter and that we just have an extended period of, of less growth than we had previously. And, and you know, all of this, we, we've previously talked you know, a while ago about the debt issue and, and it was becoming a problem. And that was before all this going on now and before the trillions a month were, were thrown at the economy and, and the crowding out of private investment fears there. And and it's it's just a weird it's a weird time you know the fed cut rates and that didn't have the the impact it should if anything like you mentioned it kind of had the opposite we we cut rates lower people don't get as much earnings on their savings yet they're saving even more because of it it's and that's that's what sort of the I don't know, maybe irony, I guess. Yeah, but it, it makes sense. It, it's, it's not irony, it's paradoxical. We're all, almost oxymoronic in the fact that lower interest rates intuitively and as designed are to stimulate borrowing and yeah. lending. I mean, just borrowing and therefore generating economic activity. It's not, it's to get you to use the money that you got right. because you're, you're, not, not, you're not earning anything. Honestly, right. so go out and spend some money and it, yet it seems as though the opposite actually happens in the fact that here we are paying nothing on deposits deposits in, in nations in banks have never been higher mm -hmm. we saw that in, in japan they lower the rates next to nothing and consumers just quit spending yeah and i think what happens is while while it's intuitive that low interest rates should do all these things mm -hmm. that we're talking about that makes sense to us it seems as though when you drive down interest rates what you're really giving the consumer is a nightmare yeah. because there, 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 were the, there is no economic growth. I, I can't make anything on my money. Right. And if I can't make anything on my money in deposits, I'm certainly not going to go out there and, and buy a bunch of stocks sure. because all hell's about to break loose. It, it, and so I'm just going to sit here. Like, I might not make a lot of money, but I know I'm not going to lose any money if I stick it yeah, in this coffee exactly, can or, exactly. I, or if I keep it, keep it in a deposit account at XYZ Bank. That's, this, that's too big to yeah, fail. Yeah. And so, so we're seeing this happen around the world, and I'm not exactly sure why central bankers aren't going to kind of wake up and go, you know, this low rates really doesn't spur people to do anything. Perhaps we need to maybe make threats the other way and get people off their butts so they'll actually do something. Yeah, and you know, this is the perfect example of the difference between economics and behavioral economics. One <laughs> One is, one is what the textbooks say should happen if mm -hmm. everyone was logical, and the other is what actually happens, and that's what we're kind of seeing right now. And we're seeing the difference between how the Fed's looking at the markets and, and how real human illogical beings react to the same the same exact market from the other side of the coin. And and it brings up a question in my head with with all this debt we're throwing out there. And maybe a period of slower growth. Do do all these bondholders get paid in full over the long term, the, in, in real terms? In real terms, no. Yes. But in I mean, absolute terms, again, absolute terms, maybe. And so this is where it gets to be real vague, and where you almost feel like a conspiracy theorist by saying the official inflation gauges that the government gives us Shady. aren't accurate. They're cheating. Um, almost intentionally. <laughs> they, well, it's not almost. It is. You know, having the rental equivalency of your primary residence be oh, 20 to 25 percent of it, which moves actually kind of in opposite directions of the of consumer yeah. inflation. Yeah. And then by having the substitution basket, and this is all good enough for cocktail party conversation, not necessarily for a graduate school thesis. But I mean, I, I've, I've tried to explain this to people, and I've explained it to my daughter, who's in college, like this. Go, Annie, you know, I like lamp. And she goes, I do. I said, what happens when lamb gets too expensive? You? She goes, you don't buy lamb. I, I said, that's right. What do I do? And she goes, yeah, I don't eat beef or something. I said, that's right. I'll go out and buy beef. I'll buy ground beef. I said, what happens to that lamb in the uh, consumption basket that the uh, government uses to calculate inflation? It gets replaced inflation? with beef. It gets replaced with beef. So lamb's so expensive, if we don't count it any longer. So what happens when beef gets too expensive? Well, Daddy, I guess you'll buy some chicken. Well, that's right. So what happens to beef and, the, and so on and yeah. so forth until, Sam, we get down to 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw know, it out spam there. Spam in those canned pork brains. And well, that's what I was going to say. Until you come down to Rose Brand <laughs> pork brains and milk <laughs> gravy that I gave a can of you. Yeah. <laughs> I gave a can to you here on uh, yesterday morning. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, when that goes up in price, we might as well just forget it because <laughs> we're kind of done. So that's what happens with inflation. So inflation is where you want to look for it. You're going to tell me that prior to the pandemic, there wasn't inflation in education. You're going to tell me there wasn't inflation in yeah. a nice meal out, that there wasn't inflation in vacations, that there wasn't inflation in and where you wanted to spend your money. No, mm -hmm. a box of Kraft macaroni and cheese might not have gone up terribly much. Or something, or some Smuckers peanut butter, or jelly, or yeah. something like that. But in terms of what people work hard to do, I would say the cost of living it up went up far faster yeah. than the cost of yeah. living. But it wasn't adequately calculated captured or, or captured yeah. in the official inflation gauges. So we have been misstating inflation. And then, oh by the way, you could argue that yeah, we've got all the inflation we want. It just happens to be Sam. In the bond market. Yeah. Or in the stock market. for. <laughs> so, and so where is their inflation? I mean, is, can be Milton Friedman, the monitors, be completely Paper wrong? Assets. Paper assets. Where is, where is the inflation? Inflation's in the bond market, which is part of the reason, Sam, you know, on our investment committee, and this is not an offer to buy or sell securities or anything like that, we have been bearish on bonds for a while. Yeah. It is a very hard argument to sit there and say, we need to load up for retail investors on an asset class that I am confident, confident you will lose your purchasing power on over the next decade. Right. And if not officially, well then, at least unofficially, when you get your money back and go try to buy something at actual market prices. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist, but at the same time, if we only think that the things that you want to spend your money on for the next year, the next 10 years, things that you want to spend your money on are only going to go up six tenths of a percentage point each year, then okay, go out and buy some treasuries. Sure. But if not, let's figure out something else to do. And so this is kind of the kind of the um, quandary where we are right now. Yeah. Where the levers, those the intuitive levers that we think should stimulate economic growth actually, Sam, kind of do the opposite. Kind of do the opposite. Paradoxical, oxymoronic, ironic, we can choose whichever adjective we want to use, but it sure is weird. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is there any generational difference to think of what no, weird is? No. Because this, is, this, is, this is beyond bizarre at least as far as I'm concerned. So guys, thank you all so much for listening. We'd love to hear from you all. So if you have any questions or comments, please let us know. You can send us an email to tradingperspectives at oakworthcapital.com where you can leave us a review on the podcast outlet of your choice. If you're interested in hearing more or reading more of what we have to say, you can check out our blog, Common Sense at oakworthcapital.com and also have to send out a congratulations to Ed who actually won the 100 bucks. Yeah from the uh, 100 podcast so guys i'm done for today but i'm gonna let sam have the last shot at it that's all i got all right me too y'all take care